So now that we've established the idea of a Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium and the equation that they came up with, we're going to be looking at what I like to consider the conditions for Hardy-Weinberg and why we don't see those conditions in reality. Okay, so let's entitle this next flowchart um, Hardy-Weinberg conditions, but Roman numeral one, HW for Hardy-Weinberg. This will be conditions Roman numeral one. And we're going to start off by just labeling out the five conditions that a Hardy-Weinberg uh, population absolutely needs. There are five conditions. And you need to know these because you need to know what is actually seen in an environment. And we're going to go over each and every one of these in terms of actuality, what's actually seen. So in a made-up Hardy-Weinberg uh, perfect population, what you have are no mutations. Okay, so there are no mutations. We're going to see why. You have, and this was alluded to in a previous video, you have random mating. Okay, so that's another condition. You have random mating. You have no natural selection acting. So there's no NS for no natural selection. You must, must, must have a very, very large population in order for that population to exhibit Hardy-Weinberg along with those other three. And then you also have the fifth and final one. You cannot have what we call gene flow. And we're going to understand all of these as we move forward through these next couple of flowcharts. So just keep these in mind. You have to memorize them and understand them. But more importantly, I think you're going to be able to better understand them if you look at what's actually seen in reality. And what's actually seen in reality, and we'll start off with the very first one, are not no mutations, but of course, mutations. Okay, Mutations are seen in reality, and we're going to see how this reality of mutations helps us understand the Hardy-Weinberg scenario. So, in reality, mutations do happen. Mutations can be defined very simply as any hereditable change in DNA. So the key idea is that the change has to be hereditable. It has to be passed on. Any hereditable change in DNA and this is going to be crucial because this hereditable change, this mutation, is thus going to have to be um, also, by definition, as a mutation, it has to be unpredictable. So it has to be rather random. Okay, so it has to be unpredictable, and it also has to be permanent. So two sub uh, requirements are unpredictable, permanent, and it has to be hereditable. It has to be a change in the DNA specifically. Okay, This is important. This is a, uh, a violation of Hardy-Weinberg because of the following situation. Mutations violate Hardy-Weinberg because they cause an immediate and direct change to the gene pool. There's an immediate change to the gene pool. And remember what the gene pool is, the collection of all the alleles and genes present within a population at a certain time. Because what happens is within a mutation, sometimes what you end up happening, what you end up have happening is a new allele altogether forming and coming out of an unpredictable and permanent nature because of a hereditable change in DNA. You get a new allele. That's a change to the gene, po gene pool. The gene pool is supposed to stay constant. It's supposed to remain constant when you add a new allele, is that constant? Of course not. You are not staying constant. In addition, another idea about mutation that we have to understand um, is a bit uh, misunderstood, actually, is the fact that not all, not all mutations, M-U-T-S for mutations, are actually passed on to the next generation. It's not a guarantee that they're going to be passed on. That's why I said hereditable here is a key word. Not all mutations passed on to next generation. And how do we know this? Well, sometimes what we see is that the somatic cells, they themselves don't pass on, pass on mutations. Somatic cells don't. Uh, if you have a mutation in your skin cell, that skin cell will not be passed on. It's not a gamete. It's not a sperm or an egg cell. Thus, it will not be inherited. It will not be um, a hereditable change in the DNA that an offspring can have. So a somatic cell mutation will not cause a problem to the offspring. In addition, sometimes a mutation can be what we refer to as silent, okay? Sometimes a mutation is silent in its uh, nature. It is an unpredictable and permanent change, but it's also silent. And we call these silent mutations, um, and we'll put this in quotes, we usually refer to them as, uh, for the most part, they are considered neutral mutations. They are 
neutral mutations because you know what happens with them? Nothing. There's actually no change overall. So there's no change to, uh, we'll say, the protein. And specifically, because there's no change to the protein, there's no change to the structure and thus the function of the organism. And also, a mutation actually won't be passed on. So a mutation won't pass on, won't pass on if it's lethal. Okay, if it's lethal, meaning that it causes death, you know what happens? The organism with the mutation dies. And if the organism with the mutation dies, they never have the chance to pass on the gene. They never have the chance to reproduce. So they can't reproduce, and thus no mutation um, is passed on. So these are the scenarios in which we don't see a mutation uh, explicitly uh, pass on itself. In addition, mutations, um, in order for them to really not have an influence, uh, not a great, terrible influence, um, is another reason why we have this very large population scenario in Hardy-Weinberg. What I mean by that is that you need, you absolutely need very large and huge populations. You need large populations in, uh, like I said, Hardy-Weinberg because... Uh, mutation effect it becomes negligible. The mutation effect is negligible. So the idea here is that though mutations are inherited and unpredictable and permanent in nature, you don't want them. And it, the best way to make sure that they're absolutely not going to happen is if you have a very large population because there's going to be a negligible effect. If one person out of the 1 billion individuals in a Hardy-Weinberg population gets a mutation, that mutation will not change the gene pool because it's so negligible. It's so irrelevant. It's one out of a billion. So that's why you need those large populations populations to really satisfy Hardy Weinberg. This unreal scenario has to have a large, infinitely large, people say, population that does not have mutation. Just as a fail-safe mechanism, you would say. And overall, mutations, of course, are generally considered the source of genetic variation altogether. Let me get that out of the way. Source of GenVar, which stands for genetic variation. So that is an important idea behind mutations. So that's what mutations are about. We know that in Hardy-Weinberg we don't want them. This is what we see in reality. And the reason why we don't want them in Hardy-Weinberg is because of the reality, the change in gene frequency and allele frequency that ensues if you have mutations. In addition, one of the ones that is uh, usually not understood that well by students is this idea of non-random mating. And this is what's seen in reality. In reality, we have non-random mating for the most part. But in our fake, in our ideal, in our made-up Hardy-Weinberg, scenario, what do we have? We have random mating. Over here we have non-random mating. So let me define these two terms very quickly. Random mating is defined as the following, just so that you have an idea of what it means to randomly mate. Random mating is that each individual, so each individual in the certain population at hand, in population, has what we would consider an equal chance. That's the key idea here. There's an equal chance. Remember what Darwin said? Differential reproductive success? Throw that out the window if you're talking about Hardy-Weinberg. Because we want random mating in which each individual in population has equal chance of mating with uh, any individual of opposite sex. Okay? Of opposite sex uh, in the population. That's what random mating is. Well, then what the heck is non-random mating? Well, non-random mating, which is actually exhibited in a human population um, for the most part, non-random mating is the following. Non-random mating can be defined as when we have the random mixing of gametes. This is a great way to describe this. It's the random mixing of gametes because this is the result of a non-random mating event. Um, it's the random mixing of gametes. Um, that idea do actually does not occur. Sorry, I sort of said that the wrong way. Random mixing of gametes does not, does not occur. Where does random mixing of gametes occur? In random mating. Random mixing, random mating. Random mixing, random mating, you get the idea. In non-random mating, this does not happen. There is a choice. This is a, the idea of sexual selection that you'll get to an animal behavior. That, that's way down the line. 
An example of non-random mating that's seen often in nature is this idea of inbreeding. Okay, This is a critical, obvious example of non-random mating in which there's a bias. There's a huge bias. And non-random mating, specifically inbreeding, is the idea in which we have mating of closely related individuals. Okay, Mating of closely related individuals individuals. And this is seen a lot in populations in the real world. These individuals are all going to end up being genetically similar. This is the idea of the gene pool being relatively similar because the mating of closely related individuals is happening in this inbreeding scenario. This is oftentimes also associated with the mating of close neighbors. So if you have mating with close neighbors or if you have inbreeding, are you satisfying Hardy Weinberg? No, you are not because that is non-random. You want random mating. You want the you want the random mixing of gametes to create a perfect non-random random scenario. And finally, inbreeding um, overall doesn't change the allele frequency, okay? So it doesn't change the allele frequency, and you might be saying, oh, okay, if it doesn't change the allele frequency, then why is it such a big problem? Isn't the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium all about allele frequencies not changing? There's a problem here, and the problem is the following, but there's a caveat here. It actually really, really increases the frequency of what we call the homozygous genotypes, okay? They, AKA, if you increase the frequency of homozygous genotypes, do you think you're increasing variation or decreasing variation? You're actually decreasing variation. Everybody is starting to look homo, the same. Everybody is starting to look very, very similar because of the inbreeding that's happening, because inbreeding is an example of non-random mating. Okay, so non-random mating is this idea of choosing, you know, what the sexual selection that you want, this idea of inbreeding possibly, or choosing based off of characteristics or resources that are available, whereas random mating is, I don't care, whatever happens, happens, there's an equal chance of every single person having um, a mating event with another individual of that population. So we have mutations and non-random mating, things that are not part of Hardy-Weinberg that are seen in reality. These are conditions we have to satisfy as stated in 1 and 2. We'll continue our discussion on 3, 4, and 5 as we move forward.